won't be reading a huge amount of verses there. Um, and by the end of the day, uh, for those of y'all that know me really well, to say that I've covered 90 chapters in four weeks, uh, that's a pretty big accomplishment for me. So, um, but we'll finish up on, on the book of Exodus today. Um, after today, we'll start going through some of the books a lot quicker. Um, we'll cover the next like three books in like a week or two, uh, in, in all honesty. And um, then we'll uh, start kind of dive into some of the historical stuff in the Bible. And it's, um, uh, I, I'm excited about getting into all that too in itself. But um, this, uh, you know, We've, we've gone through Genesis and we've seen how the human race was started, how the Hebrew race, uh, they started. We've seen how the nation of Israel, um, how they kind of got their beginning um, last week. And then um, today we're kind of going to start looking at how the um, Hebrew religion started. Because they've been following God up to this point. All right, We've seen that they've been following God. Um, he came to Abram and he said, you know, go away and I'll tell you where you're going. And he listened. And uh, and it became kind of this family religion at that point. And then um, it developed into the uh, God was the God of the people of Israel in Egypt uh, last week. And that's what we were talking about. But there was no real um, rules or really, there was no real guidelines or anything up to this point. It was just simply, um, God told Abram that, uh, at the time, and it became Abraham, he told him, he's like, okay, well, as a sign of our religion, you know, you have to circumcise all the men. And that was it. That was the only real um, indication in the, uh, like, um, part of the covenant that you have to do other than be faithful and follow him. Starting today, God starts giving, um, he, he reveals. Uh, and um, in the Bible, we, there's a word that we've, uh, we've heard all kinds of times because it's one of the books of the Bible, um, Revelation. When we hear that word, we typically just think of it as, well, uh, Revelation, that's about like the Antichrist and the end of the world and stuff like that. That's all we actually think about. Revelation is actually being revealed something. That's what that's actually talking about. And that's why the book of Revelation is called Revelation, because God is kind of pulling back the curtain on what the future is going to look like. So at this point, though, here in Exodus, God is going to start to reveal um, what he expects from his people um and he's going to start to talk about that and he's going to so uh, 19 through 40 is this revelation from god and it is um uh, moses con moses has like uh he sits down on a mountaintop with god for 40 days uh and they talk and they and god gives him directions and up to this point and, and i'm kind of getting ahead of myself up to this point, Israel has been wandering around in the wilderness for uh, for uh, a, a while. Uh, not a huge, huge amount of time, but they, they've been wandering around for a little while. God has provided for them um, food. He's provided for them clothing. Um, you know, one of the big biggest miracles in the entire Bible that we didn't even mention last week was uh, God has parted the Red Sea, and he, and he delivered them from Egypt. Um, they've seen God work in, in amazing ways. And it comes to this point where God calls Moses up onto Mount Sinai, which becomes this really big uh, part of the New Testament also down the road. But um, he calls him up onto Mount Sinai, uh, just him. And while he's up there, uh, the people around the mountain, they can hear thunder, they can see, the, uh, like, they, they can hear thunder, they can see lightning, they can see that something is going on. And God tells Moses, and it's this really cool story, and it kind of gets puts God in perspective of us. He he looks at Moses, because Moses wants to sing. Moses wants to look him eye to eye. And God says, you can't look me eye to eye. There's just something about God that is just beyond something that our physical forms can handle. And we see some kind of proof in that here in a minute. And so what he does is he kind of puts him under this cliff. And he, kind of, and he cups his hand, because we're made in God's image. We've covered that. So God in this uh, in this instant has a human form, and he kind of cups his hand over it. And uh, the Bible says that Moses can just kind of see the backs of his legs, and that's it. So God's big, all right. And this is not you know God's not like me. He's not five seven. Uh, you know he he he's big. We would look at this this uh, scene of him being this uh, this scene of uh, Moses seeing him as God almost being like a giant in this situation. But he sees him. 
And, and after they talk and after Moses comes down, and this is jumping a little bit ahead in the story, this, like being around God is so impactful and it does something even physically to us that it says that Moses' face shone so brightly, it, it shined so brightly that they actually had to put something over his face because it was hurting people's eyes to look at him. Um, you know, when I, like, get out and I work in the yard or I exercise and stuff like that, like, my face gets really sweaty and it shines. And, uh, you know, it's, it, looks, it looks rough, but, you know, the sun, the sun will shine off of it and it's blinding. Or the sun will hit my glasses just right and Alicia can't see. And, um, you know, that, that's shining. Moses' face was so bright that people could not actually see from looking at him. And that's just simply by being in the presence of God. Now, there's this huge lesson, and we're not going to get into this, but this tells us that, you know what? You can't be around God and not be changed. And that's one of the biggest things that we see in this, is that we like to say, we like, and we like to pretend that we can be around God, and we can be in church, and we have a great relationship with Him, but that there's no change. And that we're still the same person, or we have very minimal changes. All right, so Moses went up on the mountain and he looked like me. And Moses came down and he looked like a lighthouse. All right, that's a big shift. That's a big change. So when we're around God, there are huge changes that happen uh, in our lives. And the people around us can see. Now, I'm a very personal, uh, a very uh, private person. I keep stuff to myself. I don't... Um, you know, I don't go out and I don't like post all my business on the internet or anything like that. That's not me. Uh, so I, I don't do stuff like that. But um, there comes a certain point where you connect with God so much that everybody can tell. You don't have to spread the word. You don't have to tell other people what has happened. When you're around people that truly know God and love God and have connected with him and have spent time with him in prayer and have really been in his presence... You don't have to tell people, all right? People can see that in your life. So um, that's kind of like lesson one A in all this. Um, but when Moses goes up on the mountain, God gives him uh, some of the most, one of the most popular things in all of like history, something that almost everybody in modern civilization has heard of. He gives him the Ten Commandments. Now. As New Testament believers, as Christians, as people who've trusted in Jesus alone for our salvation, a lot of times we like to look at the Ten Commandments and we like to kind of just shut them off and say, that's Old Testament. I don't have to listen to that. You know, we, uh, we look at it and we're just like, that's the law. We don't have to listen to any of that. Um, well, let me ask you, look, have you murdered anybody this week? No. You almost murdered your sister. But um, you haven't murdered. Okay, good. So uh, would it have been bad if you did? No. Yeah, okay, so um, the Ten Commandments are still pretty relevant, right? So, um, and I do want to ask this, and, um, and I just gave you one. Uh, I want to see, because I'm always interested about this. Can we name the Ten Commandments? Sure. Okay, all right, so uh, give me one. Thou shalt not have other gods before God. Okay. Honor your father and mother. What was that one? Honor their parents. Okay, yeah, y'all both did that one at the same time. <laughs> the murder. Okay. We just said that. Steal. Love it. Blacking. Yeah. Okay. Do the Sabbath. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Sorry. I can't, I can't, I can't remember, remember. I can't remember the order. I know that's my problem. Um, can you write them down on the board? So we know. Which Josh was very forgotten. <laughs> I've forgotten which ones you say, kind of. Um, well, I've, I've actually got them written down up here. I just don't want to like give them away. So you. Um, Neighbor. Yeah. Yes. So there's seven. We got three more. Uh, I'm not gonna lie. The last time I asked a Sunday school class about this, I got three. So like y'all are doing good. I'm proud of y'all. So and I also cried a little bit that day. But <laughs> you turn over one page. There, there. Okay. Twenty-one. Lying. We said like we heard something. Well, steal. So adultery. We didn't say that one. Yeah, that's right. Um, You're cheating. Steal. Take the Lord's God's Lord's God's Holy. name in vain. Yep. Language. Name. Yeah. Image. We did them all, didn't we? 
Okay, let's stand. Okay. All right, cool. So you yeah, had to cheat and look them up, but yeah, all right. Just so, the last two. <laughs> I, I can know, think of the last two. We know where to find it. Though. All right. Yeah. So, um, so that he gives us these ten commandments, and and, and it's these are not. Uh, everybody likes to look at those, and everyone likes to say, well, if you can just keep the Ten Commandments, you can go to heaven. Wrong. Exactly. That is not right. God gives us the Ten Commandments as instructions on how to live our life. Um, and they're just as relevant now as they were when Moses was up on Mount Sinai. Because they still guide us in how that we live our lives. So, we're going to take a few minutes, and we're actually going to kind of look through these and talk about them just a little bit. So, like, in the Ten Commandments, and this is them in order, um, the first one is that you trust God, that you uh, that God is your only God. Um, so this is this is huge, and this is kind of like when Jesus, is, and when Jesus is asked what is the most important commandment, he starts off with this one, because if you trust God and love God with everything in you, everything else kind of falls into place. Um, so he tells him to trust God only, uh, to trust God more than anything. Um, then he tells them to worship God only. Um, that God is the only God that we have. Uh, you know, we can say that God is the biggest and God is our first, but then if we have other gods and we have other things that we worship, there's a problem. Blessing the people with Moses doing this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, we'll, and we will get to that in just a second. So, so they, he tells them to worship God only. Um, the other thing is then he tells them not to use God's name, or to don't use God's way and name in a way that doesn't honor him. So uh, we just chalk this one up and say, just don't use God's word and cuss words, and then everything's good. Well, you can use God's name in ways that don't honor him, and it's not a curse word. It's not a foul language. So that's actually breaking one of the Ten Commandments when you do that. Um, so uh, rest on the Sabbath and think about God. God, uh, God rested on the seventh day. He wants us to rest also. Um, if I'm being honest... This is the most approved sin that everybody commits. Uh, everyone, like, uh, you ask everyone, it's like, how you doing? It's like, oh, I've been busy. And it's like, you know, I never stop. I'm always doing something. And God actually tells us that we need rest, um, that we need rest. If you don't stop and you don't rest, you burn out. Um, this is true when it comes to ministry and thanks for God. And this is true even in school and life. You have to find time to rest. And when you do that, take time and, like, Think about God and meditate on God. That's actually, that was the purpose of the Sabbath. It was not to sit around and play like a Jerusalem PlayStation. It was about, um, it was about taking time out to actually focus on God and to think about him. Because when you take a step back and you actually kind of meditate on God and you kind of like focus on him, it's amazing what he shows you in those times. Um, so they would actually practice this weekly. We like to say that Sunday is the Sabbath. Sunday is one of the busiest days of the week, and the Sabbath was actually Saturday. It wasn't even Sunday, so uh, we're all off on that. But um, but it says to rest on the Sabbath and think about God. Um, respect and obey your parents. Uh, and I know, like, have y'all know. <laughs> so, um, so, Luke, respect and obey your parents, okay? You're welcome. You can give me money later. Tell me what I say to about it. Okay. Go ahead and finish the whole Bible verse of it. And thy days may be long. <laughs> like, do you want to shorten your life? Go right ahead. And if you don't respect and obey your parents, your day is really long. Um, so, uh, why is the Sabbath switched? Why is the Sabbath? Why do we do it on Sunday? Because by most calendars, Sunday is the first day of the week, so we give the first day to God. Uh, that's kind of why it's that way, um, and it's just. Um, calendar somatics really it's um but um and one of the reasons they would do it on saturdays because saturday was kind of the last day of the week and they would work all week and then they would rest uh so that's why um there's probably some more historical reasons kind of behind that too but that's kind of um what i've always been told so um i can't remember myself i'm I have to look that up. Yeah. Um, and also, if you'll notice this, and I didn't mention this, the first four deal with your relationship with God, and then the last six deal with your relationship to each other uh, and other people. So um, think about that, too. Jesus was asked, well, you know, what is the greatest commandment? He said, love God and then love people. So he kind of went in the same order as this, too. So respect and obey your parents. Luke, do that again. All right. So um, respect and obey your parents. Okay, good. So uh, that's $10 you're going to owe me. All right. So then the next six, um, do not murder. So I don't think we're going to have a whole lot of discussion and argument about this. This has been from like day one in history. 
there's not been a lot of argument about uh, do not murder, okay? That, that one's always kind of been a biggie. Um, so you do not murder. Don't commit adultery. So, uh, you know, and I will say this, uh, and Jesus kind of hits on this a little bit too when he's talking. Um, we just focus on this. It's like, well, as long as I'm not cheating on a spouse, everything's good. And like, y'all aren't married. So like, y'all, I'm good. I'm, you know, I don't have to worry about committing adultery. Um, this is sexual sin, period. Uh, so, and Jesus talks about this and he says, you know, uh, Moses said, don't commit adultery. He says, and then Jesus told him, he's like, if you look upon someone with lust in your heart, that's the same as committing adultery in your heart. So, um, this is just sexual sin in general. So, uh, kind of stay away from that. Uh, don't steal. So if I walked over and I just like took Luke's wallet, are you cool with that? Well, I don't have my wallet with me today. <laughs> <laughs> Don't steal. So uh, you don't want to steal. You don't want to take anything from anybody else. Uh, you know, that's not an approved thing. Um, don't lie. Uh, you know, uh, nobody likes a liar. Uh, it drives me insane. Uh, everyone thinks I'm stupid and they like tell me lies and they're like, I got one over on him. And, no, you didn't. So uh, don't lie. Uh, you know, um, that's just dishonoring to God. Um, don't covet and or just kind of be satisfied with what you have. Uh, and it's okay to want things. And this is like really, there's a lot of confusion about this one. We see people that like, they're like, well, I can't want anything in life then, or that's a sin. No, it's, um, what it is is like when we like desire stuff, we've kind of become obsessive about it. I do at least, man. When I think about something that I want, I become obsessed with it. And that's all I want. Um, you know, and I get really, uh, I get just uh, obsessed with it and I just become consumed with it. Um, coveting though here, it could also be like if, um, if you know, friend has something. yeah, if like, you know, uh, Luke gets, um, a, a big, nice Jeep for his uh, 16th birthday. And I decide that like, I'm going to, I covet this Jeep so much. And I want this Jeep that he has so much. Uh, you're, you're hurting your sister. You're not going to get that. So, um, so I, and I want this so badly that it can actually lead me to a place where I steal or I murder and steal Whoa. or, or, you know, it covet can lead to more. And that's one of the things. And a lot of these, uh, and a lot of these commandments, when you break one, it leads to another. Um, you know, David, it actually said that, um, when he committed sin with, uh, his sin with Bathsheba, that he actually throughout this actually broke all 10 commandments, uh, in one occasion. So they can, uh, lead and it all like his, his started with adultery because he lusted after somebody. Then he coveted, then he lied, then he stole, then he murdered. And then all throughout that. He was dishonoring to God. So all these different things are lessons on how that we should live life and how that we should do. Um, and Jesus, and I kind of hit this a little bit with like the adultery and the sexual sin part, but um, with this like do not murder, Jesus actually told us, he said that if you um, are angry with somebody and you hate somebody, it's the same as murder in your heart. Moses dealt with the physical and the outward action. He, he dealt with how we handled things physically. Murder is a physical act. But Jesus told us that there's a deeper problem inside of us, in our heart. Um, and so we like to think and we kind of confuse ourselves. And especially in like the church age that we live in, we like to get to this place where we think that as long as I'm doing the right things or I'm not doing the wrong things, as long as I'm hitting that checklist, <clears throat> We're good. But Jesus told us that, he, that our relationship to God is about our heart and about our connection to him and our relationship to him. It's not about, it's not just about our actions. If your heart is right, your activity, your actions are going to be correct. So he, uh, he gave Moses these Ten Commandments. He, and he gave them on, a, on two, uh, two stone tablets that were literally written with the hand of God. Um, pretty cool thing to have, you know, that was, I would definitely want that sitting on my bookshelf at home. And, um, he gave them to God or he, God gave them to Moses. Moses went down and like Luke was actually talking about when they got down to the bottom of the mountain, Aaron, 
the high priest that we'll mention here in a second, Aaron, uh, Aaron the high priest, he convinced all the people to make a golden calf statue. And one of the things that gets confused about this is a lot of people think that they were trying to worship some other god. They weren't. They were trying to make an image to God that was up on the mountain. But, you guys didn't catch this before, uh, worship God only. This is talking about not making any graven images either. That's actually the literal wording of the commandment. So, God's telling them, don't make any images of me to worship. And they're down at the bottom of the hill making an image to worship. So, uh, Moses goes down, and he has a Josh moment. He goes down there, and he sees what's going on, and he loses his mind. And he actually takes these amazing stone tablets that God had just literally written with his own fingers, and he gets mad, and he throws them down, and he breaks them. And uh, and a bunch of stuff happens, and I can't get into 100% of it, but um, they they smash the, uh, the altar into pieces. They put it in the water, and all the people have to drink it. It's incredibly bitter and horrible. It's this life lesson that sin is bitter. Then he goes back up into the mountain, and God allows him to actually do uh, make the Ten Commandments, or like make the stone tablets himself. And again, he goes down and he has the two tablets. So, at this point, they begin to lay out the the uh, Hebrew religion, the Jewish religion. And um, Moses comes back down, and um, one of the things, and, and I was talking about this before. Uh, before we kind of get into some of the like uh, nuts and bolts of this, um, Jesus wanted to make sure that we understood that he was not um, against the law, like a lot of people think that he is. Matthew five seventeen, and this is Jesus speaking. He says, "Think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am come not to destroy, but to fulfill." So Jesus actually came to fulfill the law. Jesus actually came to. Um, to kind of continue this, because remember, we started all the way back in Genesis with a promise that Jesus was going to come. And then it came to Abraham, and then it came to Isaac, to Jacob, to, and then to the nation of Israel. And now Moses has been given the law in the wilderness, and Jesus is the fulfillment of all of that. So he's not, and, and this is like a, another side note, okay? For the people that say the Old Testament don't matter, this, all right? It does. Um, Jesus has come to fulfill it, not to do away with it. We're not under the old covenant, but he's come to fulfill it and make it a new covenant. So um, what happens now is that they go and they actually, um, they begin to build these, uh, they kind of build like a portable church in essence. Um, the first thing that they build is this thing called the Ark of the Covenant. And what they do with the Ark of the Covenant is it's this box. And Don't you have a picture of it? I, I do. Um, I, and I actually put this up here so you could uh, see it a little bit better. But um, the Ark of the Covenant, this is like a chest that they would carry stuff around in. And in the wilderness, God had given them manna. God had given them quail. He had also given them Ten Commandments. So they actually put the, and the, and the staff that uh, would turn into a snake and stuff that uh, just scares me to death. They put these things in this box as a reminder and, and as kind of a holy place to keep it. Um, and this becomes one of the most, if not the most, holy object in all of Israel. Um, these things up here, I know they look like angels. They're actually cherubims. Um, and that is, this is called the mercy seat. And um, what this is, this is going to sit in the middle of the tabernacle that we're going to look at in just a second. And once a year, the high priest would come in and he would take blood from the sin offering that they would offer. And over the next few weeks, y'all are going to hear a lot about offerings. Um, and he would take this and he would actually sprinkle it on this seat because this is where God resided, kind of, on earth. And it was the place of uh, forgiveness there. That would, they would sprinkle the sin offering there and it was a place for them to... Um, offer up there, and it was just this central uh, holy place. Yeah. It's almost like a movable altar. Yeah, it's, like, yeah, it's kind of like a movable altar. It really is. There, This actually, when they build the temple in Israel, this is actually in there. Uh, so, um, this is this holy place that they uh, that they're able to put that in. That's still like... Uh, Nobody knows where it is. Um, there, uh, Israel gets defeated and uh, just flat whooped a couple times and they lose everything and at one of the points when they lose everything this is taken um and there's a lot of theories and i'll be honest and no <laughs> nobody knows where it is and that's part of the that's part of the problem and that's part of the reason that people have all these crazy ideas 
at the end of the day, it's probably in ruins somewhere. Uh, it could be somewhere else. Uh, if you want to ask me later, I, it's not so, it's not like lesson material, but there are some ideas about where it could possibly be. But um, so this is this was like the central place of their worship. Um, now this was placed in the tabernacle. This becomes like their um, it, it's a, it's a movable church. It is what it is. It's a move because they wouldn't gather like in a congregation like we gather. What they would do is they had priests, and what a priest would be is like let's say the Todd is our high priest. Um, they would uh, they would give their offerings to Todd, and Todd would go in and he would uh, he would make the sacrifice that needed to be made, and he would make it right here, and that's actually a place to burn stuff. And then he would go and he would wash up. And then he would take it into the tent. And in the tent, there was a whole lot more stuff in there. But this outer gate was kind of a way to keep people out because this was such a holy place. They didn't just let people wander in and out. The Jewish religion had a lot of separation between people and God. Um, you know, in the Gospels, and we, and we talk about this a lot around Easter too, uh, you know, uh, it talks about how in the temple when Jesus dies, that the veil is rent in half. It's torn in half. You guys have probably heard me talk about it. I know you've heard Todd talk about it. Um, the veil is what keeps people from, uh, it keeps people out of this holiest of holies place. So with the Jewish people, there's an unbelievable separation between people and God. And in their, in their minds and with what God tells them, that this is the dwelling place of God on earth. This is where God, this is kind of where heaven and earth meet. So, uh, and when the tabernacle is actually built, it says that there's like a fog that comes around the tabernacle and that there's a light and that God is actually residing there on the mercy seat and that he's residing in there. So when you take all that into account, you can see why there was so much, um, does, uh, there was so much, um, oh, what's the word I'm trying to think of? Um, they looked at this as such a holy and respected place that they that they would not disrespect this, that they would um, kind of keep it at arm's length because they were scared of it. Um, there's times throughout the Old Testament where people went in here unprepared and God dropped them. Uh, God would kill them because they would go in with sin in their heart or they would go in unprepared. There's actually an old tradition and um, that the Jews would talk about that when the whole actual temple is built, that the high priest, when he would go in, to uh, offer at the uh, offer at the altar in the actual temple, that they would tie a rope to his ankle in case that he went in with sin and he died, so they could, didn't have to go in and actually get him. That they could just pull him out because they, if he died because he had sin in their life, man, they were too scared to go in, and he's a high priest. So um, that was one of the like kind of things that they would view. This is a mobile thing, and what would happen is, and remember, man, the nation of Israel is like two to three million people wandering around in the desert in the wilderness. When they would stop to camp, and they would camp for longer than a day, like it wasn't like they would break this down every single day. Um, they, when they would stop and put up camp, the Levites, which was the tribe of Levi, uh, one of Israel's sons, remember that, they were in charge of this. So in the very middle of the camp, they would actually build this, uh, they would actually put this up, and like some, like one person, he would be responsible for that post. And he would come, and he knew exactly where that post would go. And the Levites would camp out here beside it, and they would protect it and take care of this. So they would put it all together. This tent had so much more stuff in it than just, like, what it looks like. And this is a horrible grainy picture, and it was one of the best I could find, though, of it. In the tabernacle, uh, which and in the holiest of holies, you would have, there's the Ark of the Covenant. There's, like, light shining off that, but it's too pixelated to really tell. Um, and that's supposed to be God. Then you have this curtain, this veil that's blocking even um, because there was layers. And what it is, certain people could come to this outside layer inside the fence. Then there was a next level of priest, like a kind of a little bit of a higher up priest that could come into the tent and could come in this area. But only the high priest could pass by this veil right here into the Holy of Holies, uh, where God resided. And that's where the offerings would take place. So, this became the central place of their worship. 
And this became the central place of their forgiveness, too. You see, they didn't just pray to God and say, God, forgive me for this sin, forgive me for this sin, I really messed up today, and then they went about their day. They had to go, and what they would do, and we'll kind of see this over the next couple of weeks, they would take um, a dove, and they would go to the high priest, and they would be like, you know, I've sinned, sacrifice it. And they would give him the dove, uh, and there's very clear guidelines on like what, would, what needed to be offered for what. And when they and then the high priest he would offer up that that life and the blood for a uh, sacrifice for their sins. It was a really bloody religion, and it was a really horrible thing at times. And um, there's actually um, when we get into the main temple that Solomon builds, and this is uh, this is nasty. I know some of y'all just ate breakfast and stuff, but like there was actually trenches for blood to pour out of the temple because there was so continual there was so many continual sacrifices going on in the temple. Um, blood is an important part of the sacrifice and um, what has been offered for sin and that's why we use that phrase the blood of Jesus so much because it was his sacrifice that actually made us able to have that relationship with God have us be able to be saved um, because what this did this didn't forgive our sins what this did was this kind of held our sins back uh, and it would give us, uh, it would give the people uh, a chance, is basically all it would do. And it was about following God, just like it is still today. Uh, Hebrews actually writes, and it talks about Abraham. It was by Abraham's faith that he was made righteous in God's eyes. It wasn't by his sacrifices. It wasn't by circumcision. It wasn't by anything, but it was by his faith in God. So a lot of people, and, and I'm sure all y'all have heard this before, and I'm going to be honest, I've heard it before, and there's times, and I'll repent right now of it, there's times that I've actually taught this uh, a while back. But it's not about the sacrifices, or it's not about, it was never about the sacrifices or the work. It's always been about the faith in God. You see, the, in the Old Testament, their faith depended on a coming Savior. If they had their faith in God that he was going to provide a savior, if he was going to fulfill that promise, they could have salvation. We have, uh, we have the, uh, the blessing that we can look back and we have a record of what he did and how he came for us. So we don't have to worry about the fact that is he going to come, when is he going to come, what's it going to look like, what am I going to have to do. We have a detailed account. Um, and because of that, we don't have to go through anything like this. We don't have to jump through any hopes um, to reach that, uh, to hold back our sin. We just have simply have to have faith in him and put our trust and give him our lives, um, which is the same thing that they had to do, but that's all we've got to do and live for him. That was so, a level of commitment, too, to do this. Yes. I mean, I mean that's... <laughs> they're get, they're giving away they're giving up animals for these sacrifices and they're it's not like they, they these animals and I mean this is a kind of for some of us we look at this as kind of barbaric but they're like giving up their food as just a sacrifice because they had a, a moment of a lack of faith they had a moment where they coveted what their neighbor had um, or they they're giving up things that they needed to survive just to simply hold back from their sin and to I want to be careful saying this. If this was how we had to practice our faith today, every church in America would be almost empty uh, with the commitment level that we show right now. Um, so this, uh, this was an unbelievable level of commitment. But the end of Exodus comes to the end of building this tabernacle. We get into a little bit of what we're going to kind of look at over the next couple of weeks is the end of Moses' life and what that looked like, and then um, and then we'll start diving into some of the history. Does anybody have any questions or like I know this is kind of strange stuff a little bit, but how would they take down that if only the priests were still allowed to go in there? The priests would do it. Uh, they they um, they had very specific instructions uh, on like how to do this, and some of them are actually in the Bible. Some of them aren't. Some of it was just like you know. Uh, Malachi, you get this post. Malachi, you get this post. Uh, you know, we'll take down. Uh, and what they would do is like the ark. Um, these posts right here, this was for four people to carry. Uh, so they could carry it. 
Um, th and it's like you had to carry it by where you were supposed to be because if you touched it in the wrong place, you're dead. Um, mm -hmm. And there's actually uh, occasions of that where someone uh, there's a really weird story, <laughs> and I and I like I'm just going to be honest, and you know I don't pretend to know everything. I have no idea why it happened like this. The ark was actually about to fall, and this one guy reaches up to catch it from falling, and. Dude, that sounds good. That sounds like something you'd want to do. Dude. It sounds like something that would be God honoring. But he touched the side of it when he did, and God struck him down. Um, and I'm gonna be honest, I have no idea why that happened. Uh, it, uh, it's it has to do with the holiness of the ark and everything, and I and I get that. But like, it seems to me it would have been worse if like everything rolled out of that and like broke the jar of manna and stuff. But uh, but yeah, they would actually they would carry it out and like, and it's something about everything put together is too what makes this uh, so like. So like when they take the veil down, it's different, you know. It's uh, so yeah. That's I, I hope that kind of answers your question. But um, anybody else have anything? All right. So starting next week, we get into uh, the reading plan killers. We get into like Leviticus and Deuteronomy and Numbers. But um, they're they're cool books. Uh, they're uh, they're monotonous. I'll be honest. We cut that off, Alicia. Um, so uh, but um, how we're going to look at it? They're really kind of cool. There's some cool stuff in the stories. Uh,